So I give you Simon Foster. Simon Foster, some of you know me, some of you don't. Um, and ever since I was a little child, I wanted to be a rocket scientist. So basically, like most children, they want to be rocket scientists, and then as they grow up, they decide that they don't want to, they go and do something more useful. I went to university and become a rocket scientist, and basically, hopefully, <laughs> through this talk, I'm going to teach you what it took me four years to learn in about 40 minutes, which is quite worrying about the modern state of education. But before we get started, and I've had to put it here to remind myself, can I please have a volunteer from someone? <laughs> right, okay, sir. Uh, before I say, are you in a fit state to be yeah. doing things? Seriously. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, because again, this was on risk assessment before. Yeah. I'm not worried about drink too much. No, so, yeah. Right, okay, come on up, sir. What's your name? Tom. Tom. I'm Simon, nice to meet you. Right, just stand there for two seconds if you can. Right, okay, brilliant. Because the ideas of using rockets isn't a new one. It goes back thousands of years, basically, to the ancient Chinese. Now, they've got their, their old texts called the I Ching, basically, and, um, and that just means like teaching book. And in it, it's got lots of things. Basically, the emperor had come down from heaven and he needed to go know what was going on in the stars. Basically, he had a lot of astrologers, alchemists going on. And in one of these books, it says, whatever you do, don't mix two chemicals together because you might get a fire or an explosion. Now, after a little while, the Chinese decided that this actually might be quite a good thing. And what they'd actually invented was, or discovered, was gunpowder. And gunpowder is incredibly easy to make, okay? It's got three basic ingredients. And these are sulfur, which we've got here. So when it gives you that rotten egg smell, it's basically in eggs, it's a little bit of sulfur is reacted with oxygen. Something called charcoal, which you all know from your barbecue. So when you basically use your barbecue, the energy that's in this charcoal is released over a long period of time. And then here we have something called potassium nitrate or saltpeter. Okay, this is the stuff, it's called an oxidizer. So basically it very rapidly supplies the charcoal with oxygen, meaning that you get a bang or explosion. And that's what hopefully we're going to do with you, Tom. So I forgot to do this. Can I get you... Um, any gloves, please. You're not allergic to latex, no, are you? No, that's, that's all right. It sounds like a very bad come on. But, um, <laughs> so, yeah. uh, that works better with women, usually. But anyway, uh, and you need a mask as well, please. Okay. Oh, sorry, this is all health and safety. My, my health and my safety is very second to yours, actually, and you're going to need uh, safety glasses as well. So basically, that's the first thing we're going to do. Hopefully, we're going to make some gunpowder. I should point out that gunpowder, saltpeter, which I've got here, actually can be made from human urine. If you, uh, you urinate on straw, which some of you may be doing, I don't know, but um, it basically reacts with the straw and you get saltpeter. And there was a time that saltpeter was so sought after, all your urine was actually the property of the government. So they would actually collect it to make this stuff for use in gunpowder. Sorry, I think they're small ones. Yeah, but okay. So, right, Tom, if you can come up, please. It, eventually, I tell her, don't worry about it, it's right. If it eats through your fingers, it'll be alright, it'll grow back to skin. Right, right. Right. right, okay. And you've got your mask as well. Right, it's mainly because this stuff is very toxic, okay? Um, right, okay. Is it? Oh, okay. So, uh, <laughs> I make the jokes. Okay, you're just an invited guest. Okay, right, okay. So, can I have three spoonfuls of the saltpeter, potassium nitrate, and put it in our pestle and mortar, please? So, we've got it there. Just three loads of that, please. You can see it's a very exact science rocketry. So, just you can pretty much pour all of this in. I've got a massive vat of it. So, this stuff is actually, I've got about a kilo and a half of it just sitting there. I carry it around on the tube with me, and I have been held up at gunpoint quite a lot by the police. Luckily, they don't know any chemistry. But this stuff, with about a kilo and a half, you could make a decent sized bomb. Uh, how much is left? Actually, how much did you put in there? Three of those. Three of those. Put in another three, actually. <laughs> okay, because I don't think we're going to get... We want to get some going. Yeah, a little bit more. You're, you're quite conservative there, so... Right, that'll do. Yeah. Right, good. Now, I want one spoonful of charcoal, please. One. Actually, make it two, because you put three in there. So this is the charcoal. So we're actually making gunpowder. This isn't done very often anymore because we don't need it. It's actually also illegal, which is why I get someone else to do it in the show. <laughs> it's actually 15 years. It's, it's legal to have this stuff. As with everything, as we pro probably must say, you know, uh, preparation is the key. So you can have this stuff as long as you don't prepare it. And the rest of the sulfur in there. The sulfur, yeah, isn't really needed. It 
just lowers the temperature at which the reaction needs to take place. So, can you please start grinding that up, please, all together? Yep, there it is. I don't know which is which, in all honesty. Is that the pinch water? Is it? Pump? I, I, to be honest, I'm a very poor scientist. Um, right. Well, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, not not all. Brian Cox isn't. But um, you know, we won't go there. Right. So we've got. Hopefully. So we've ground up. We've got a gunpowder now. That should be right. Let's have a look. Yeah, that's nicely ground up. Right. So let's try and see if we can get this working. So basically, this is thousands of years old. Move the vitals. Pardon? Move the vitals. I want to go. There you go. Right, let's try it. Max broke, right? I can't see the action. <laughs> so let's see, hopefully this will work. If not, I'm blaming you. Hey! <laughs> Oh, there we go. Right. So, that's our gunpowder. So, warm round of applause for you for Tom. And I've got a prize for you for actually doing that. Please have a astronaut ice cream sandwich there, actually. So now we've got some of you. Now more people are going to volunteer later on, aren't they? We've got the munchies. So basically, so you can make gunpowder very, very easy with just ingredients you've got around your house. Basically, charcoal is saltpeter actually is in weed killer. So weed killer and fertilizer is basically what saltpeter is. So you can make bombs very, very easily. And so this is one we kind of made recently. Hopefully I'll turn the sound up. Oh Christ, I won't. Right. So you can either get it right or wrong. You don't really want your rockets to do that. You want them to launch. And so basically, what the ancient Chinese did, they packed this stuff into like kind of bamboo and stuff like that, sealed one end off, had these waste gases coming out the other end. And basically, they discovered about a thousand and a half years before Sir Isaac Newton came up with it, Newton's third law of motion. And that is for every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. What does that mean? Well, many of you have probably been ice skating. If you push in one direction, you've got your ice skates, your feet usually shoot out in the opposite direction. You have an action in that direction, a reaction in the opposite direction. This is basically how all rockets work, basically. You just have some sort of gas pushing out the back and your rocket will shoot upwards. So basically, the Chinese basically were very into this. And there was a scientist, well, a politician as well, it was called Wang Hu. And the Chinese government, this is about 2,000 years ago, insist that this was the first ever astronaut. Okay, so about 2,000 years ago, this guy had the diamond bullet idea, because China was vast and he had to get around it, of taking a chair and placing 36 rockets around the bottom of it, ah. lighting it, and basically his idea, he was going to fly around the country, basically. And you can see his mate is looking on here, probably for the right reason. Now, I shamelessly ripped this off of Mythbusters. Basically, they recreated it. You can see it. He has got a kite on top there, because obviously he was thinking about it. He had to float back down. So, here he goes, right? So he got all it down there. This is a crash test dummy could buy. They said he disappeared in a puff of smoke and it was a successful launch. So let's see what happens. One. <laughs> so there was a puff of smoke uh, and you can see the chair was left behind. You can probably tell it didn't quite work because no one ever repeated the experiment. Which, if it was a successful launch, people would have kind of repeated the experiment after that, you would hope. So basically, I'm going to shamelessly miss out about... 2,000 years of history and move on to World War II. And there's this guy here, I don't know if any of you heard of him, he's called Werner Von Braun. He's basically uh, described as the father of NASA, basically. And this is how he wants to be remembered. A visionary with one of his rockets looking out to the future. But before he worked with like NASA, or before he worked for NASA, he worked for another acronym, and this was the Nazi Party, basically. And here he is with his friend Dornberger, and here he is collecting his Iron Cross. This is actually a telegram from Adolf Hitler basically, and this guy was quite a hard Nazi, like, his, it's not like, you know, your mum and dad said, he, oh, he just fell in with the wrong crowd, or it was just a phase he was going through, this guy enjoyed being a Nazi, okay, he rocked the Nazi look, and like, kind of not in an ironic Shoreditch way, this guy really, really got into it, basically, and he, he helped build two different types of rockets, there was one called the V1, and that's actually what, we're going to try and repeat the experiment today here, with this here, it's called the Doodlebug, Okay, 
and, it, and it's a very, very simple rocket. You can see it here. So this is it here. Basically, it's just what's called a pulse jet on the back. And basically, all this is, it just runs on methanol, alcohol. So all the stuff you're drinking there is basically rocket fuel. That's ethanol, what you're drinking. Oh, and here's the normal sound of the doodlebug. So this sound used to terrify people about 60, 70 years ago in London, all around here. As soon as it cut off like that, then you're worried because the thing was starting to fall on you. And it basically run on methanol. Now, this stuff, you can go into a chemist, pick it up very, very easily. I should point out, it isn't purple by colour. Alcohol, methanol is actually clear. They put the purple in it as a poison to stop kind of tramps and alcoholics drinking it. But what's really worrying is they've actually built up an immunity to this poison. So you've kind of got more evidence for evolution there, ladies and gentlemen. But um, it's a poor joke. Right, anyway, so I basically built a doodlebug engine here out of a jam jar with a hole in it. And what happens is the ethanol inside it, I'll give it a shake, is basically vaporized, becomes a gas. And what it does is when I set fire to it, Basically, you'll get a flame that instantly puts the flame out. There's not enough oxygen in there, so it goes out. Air then rushes in, and the mixture is hopefully hot enough. It goes on, off, on, off, and you get that kind of terrifying doodlebug sound. So let's hope this works. I'm going to put it down here, actually, again, out of safety. You keep your fingers crossed, please, actually, because sometimes this works, sometimes it doesn't. And I've got a safety blanket here, which is actually just a tea towel. So, uh, kind of, uh, I built that box myself as well. So, hopefully, this will work. I should have put my safety glasses on. Yeah, right. Right, 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 right. Okay, so let's hope our doodle bug. It worked in my kitchen at home the other day. Wow. That's annoying. But you can hear it there. It worked really well the other day, I, I promise you. You can hear it farting. Oh, Jesus. Right, uh, right. Because it can break. Right, so that's the doodle bug basically there. So these things are really, really easy to make. Now, after the doodle bug, he basically went off and he built something more impressive. Oh, there it is, just in case. This is him We're working on a rocket called the V2. So I need this, my voice is so loud, I probably don't need it, actually, it's quieter now. But he worked on something called the V2. Again, that was fueled by alcohol. So basically, these things would come crashing down on London, so most of them didn't work. It was only about, about one in 10 was a successful launch. Most of them very luckily blew up on the test launch there, but occasionally some did take off, some got through, here's a successful launch, and all this is is just basically alcohol reacting with oxygen, and it's, it's a glorified version of plumbing basically, there's nothing that kind of interesting or that kind of technical about it, it's just alcohol burning, launching these things off into the space. So basically, after World War II, we had the period called the Cold War. Werner runs off and works for the Americans. Loads of poor other um, German rocket scientists got caught by the USSR, and they went to work for them. Now, there was a period called the Cold War, and during this, both sides developed nuclear weapons. But they knew that if they launched their nuclear weapons at each other, that they would have time for the, uh, the opposition or the enemy country to launch theirs, and they'd wipe each other out. It's called Mutually Assured Destruction, or MAD. So instead of going to war, they decided to try and beat each other using science. And one of the things they tried to go for was the space race, to try and get people up into space. But to get people into space, you need bigger and bigger rockets. So the V2 is down here, just his scale. This is about 11 meters high, okay? So it's about three stories. The Saturn V that got people into space is here. That one there is about 33 stories high. Okay, it's bigger than the Statue of Liberty. It weighed 2,800 tons. Okay, that was when it was fueled. It could only actually carry 10 tons into space. So it could get hardly anything into space, this thing. It's nearly all fuel. And these things are actually very, they're not much thicker than the Coke can. Okay, these things are really, really, really thin. So basically, to get these big rockets into space, we need new fuels. So can I have another volunteer, please, anywhere? It actually, it really can't be a child for this one, actually. I'd like to point out, actually, it can't be. So, have you been taking anything? No. no sorry, no, just the face paint. I was like, uh, okay, a little bit alarm there. I was going to say, like, we've got, okay, you're an electron. That's wonderful. So she hasn't been taking anything, our little electron friend here. Right, okay. So if you just stand there for a little while. So basically, 
What they just, oh, you just stand, thank you. So basically, to get into space, we needed new fuels, and one of the fuels they looked at was basically water. I know that sounds weird, but if you know the chemical formula, water is H2O. That's two parts hydrogen, one part oxygen. And basically, you can see here that the hydrogen is slightly positively charged, the oxygen is slightly negatively charged. So amazing as it sounds, you could actually get electricity to pull the water apart. So some of you have got the batteries and the cups I gave you. Hopefully still none of you have drunk it. Can you please drop the battery into the water? Now you should see on the fatter the uh, negative terminal. Hopefully you should be able to see bubbles forming. That's hydrogen gas being given off. So that's really, really easy. Okay, So you've basically just got rocket fuel there being given off. Okay, very easy to do. Now you can make it in a million different ways. I've been doing it out the back all morning. And basically, the great thing about hydrogen is that when it reacts with oxygen, basically all you get out is water and energy. Easy to make, it doesn't produce any pollution. You get a very powerful explosion. So this stuff is brilliant fuel. I should point out that the Russians at the time came up with a better fuel. Uh, it was a mixture of nitrogen, hydrogen and oxygen. The problem was that when you ignited it, it actually was very, very combustible, very volatile. But its waste product was nitric acid. So the USSR, the Soviet rockets, would go flying over, pouring out concentrated nitric acid onto the countryside and the people below it. After a while, they decided to kind of switch that and they went to hydrogen as well. So, the problem with hydrogen is, as you can tell, if any of you know, it's actually lighter than air gas, okay? So you can put it into balloons, about to find out and uh, so you can same with helium as well the thing is how do you know what is hydrogen and what's helium so this is a political rally we always see helium balloons there so basically we're going to play a game of hydrogen or helium okay <laughs> now there are two balloons outside i didn't want to bring them in usually i do it in here but it would have been an inferno, I assure you. So uh, you're going to have to believe me that there are two balloons outside and it's not me just going bang. Okay, so we've got two balloons out there. One's hydrogen, one's helium. If you guess correctly, you keep your face. <laughs> <laughs> if you guess badly, well, you get a cake. Okay, so it's win-win. <laughs> right, okay. So... Hopefully out here we should see, so we've got a balloon there attached very nicely there and we've got one round the corner. Oh, it's looking a bit feeble at the moment. Right, so you've got to decide which one you're going to go for, okay? You're going to ignite it. Yes. Which is well is the, the nice music. So there's one to your, there attached to that chair and one attached to the tent actually, which is quite badly thought out by me. Right. What one are you going to go for? Big one. Right, okay. Let's see if you keep your face. Right. Can you light that, please? It's, not, it's probably not instilling you with confidence. So <laughs> you light a match, is it? <coughs> right. I'm hoping this music will uh, kind of placate any screaming. Right, um, here we go. Right, so let's see if the balloon outside is hydrogen or heating. You've got hydrogen. Hold it near it. Woo so that was high helium. Let's try and ignite the hydrogen one. I'll do that. So you can... <laughs> <laughs> there's one here. It's looking very feeble at the moment, Children are about to play my favourite game of hydrogen or helium. 
basically. So you can see this is a political rally. This has happened to me. I had it the other way around. So you can see all these balloons here. What do you think might happen, ladies and gentlemen? Get ready. They'd filled them accidentally. Instead of with helium, they'd filled them with hydrogen. And this, uh, this actually happened, this happened in May. There's a woman there going for the Olympic torch relay. She's really going <laughs> to the spirit of it, isn't it? But uh, luckily she was okay. But, um, so this is a really, really powerful fuel. And we've got it here, so basically this is one of the space shuttles launching. Hopefully the video stopped. And in the engines here, five tons of hydrogen is being used every second. So that's about the weight of five cars is being ignited. Do you think that tiny pop out there was about the size of my fist, that balloon? That there, okay, you've got around, yeah, five tons of fuel being burnt every second. The power coming from these engines is enormous. One of these engines is about the size of this room. So you can imagine the kind of heat that's being given off there. That's why the flame's gone blue. Now, in all of this, what actually happened? Well, it was the Soviets that got the first object into space. It was a satellite called Sputnik, and it was in 1957. Now, you ladies and gentlemen are about to hear the scariest sound many Americans had ever heard. Basically, this here, the Sputnik was uh, transmitting on a radio signal, so you could easily tune your radio in, and you could hear Sputnik going over. And this is what it sounded like. You turn your radio on, you'd hear that. Now, to us, that doesn't sound particularly scary, but to many Americans, they had no idea what it meant. They actually thought it was trying to control their minds. They thought that beeping actually meant be a communist. Okay? It, they really, really believed this. Hype the Cold War. It wasn't helped because Sputnik's uh, trajectory actually flew over Florida. Now, at the time, many people had radio-controlled garage doors. Accidentally, I don't know, Sputnik was transmitting on the same signal, same frequency as many of these garage doors. So every time Sputnik would fly over, all these garage doors would start opening and closing. This really freaked them out. It was like a really shit episode of Doctor Who, basically. Like people getting swallowed by the garage doors. But obviously, people were really freaked out by this. My God, if they can control their garage doors, what can these people do? So they got really, really freaked out by this. So they got damn, they ain't got to control my garage door. So they said, right, we've got to do something. We've got to get a human being into space. So basically, they, they tried to. The problem is, with getting a human being into space, there's something called escape velocity. Basically, to escape Earth's gravity, a human being or any object needs to be travelling at 11,000 metres a second. That's 11 kilometres a second. Now, bizarrely, getting to that speed isn't a problem. Okay, four normal objects. The problem is you get something called G-force. Now, many of you have been on the road, you accelerate, you slow down, you feel yourself being pulled forwards and backwards. It's like artificial gravity. You go around the corner, you feel yourself being pulled in a certain direction. To get into space, you need to be pulling at some point 9 to 10 Gs. That's 9 or 10 times the pull of gravity. So, to make things easier, say I weigh 100 kilograms, that would mean I would at a certain point on that flight feel like I weighed 1,000 kilograms. I would feel like I weighed a ton. That puts a tremendous strain on the human body. Now, actually, to test astronauts out in this, what they do is they put people in a centrifuge. So there's someone in this, basically, and they spun around. And it's basically a glorified roundabout. Okay, so you, if you want to do astronaut training, which obviously I did as a child, you put someone on this, on a roundabout, and you just spin them around and wait for them to vomit, fly off, pass out, something like that. And the great thing is, they actually put cameras inside these things. Okay, so here's some people undergoing astronaut training. This is called a dead man's stick. The reason is, when you pass out, you basically let go. In the top right hand corner, you can see the Gs, the amount of gravity they're pulling. These guys get to about four or five times the pull of gravity. Now, you can see there, the soft, squishy stuff pulled backwards. Other problem is, very hard to breathe. Your lungs get compressed against your ribcage. You can't breathe anymore. The other problem is, all your blood gets pulled down to your feet. It's very hard for the blood to get up to your head. So basically, you start to faint. So these people are gurning away. There were so many people that looked like this last night. It was a group's manoeuvre. And there was a guy who looked just like that. Okay, uh, this guy's really enjoying it as well. So basically, the problem is, the blood won't go to your brain. Now, you don't want that. If you're trying to fly a rocket, you want to try and stay conscious. She's quite hardcore. She gets up to about six Gs. Okay? Now, eventually, what happens is, blood stops. You can't control your body anymore. You pass out like this guy. Oh, no. <laughs> now, he's gone completely, okay? Because him, the problem is you're about to see. So he's voluntarily shaking, he's passed out. The blood has not got to his head. He's gone. Now, that's the problem. Here, you can just turn the machine off, 
return to normal gravity, hopefully the heart will pump blood back up to your brain, you're okay. Problem is, you don't want that with an astronaut, basically. You've got to be really careful because you don't want your astronaut to suffer a heart attack or die on the way into space. Now, there's another problem. As you can see, they're all all right at the end now. I'm not quite that sadistic. So they're all smiling and the blood's returned to them and they're all happy. Now, there's another problem, okay? So this is it here. You can see them. They're going, um, because you've got, like, liquidy contents inside you. And they all get forced around so they can lip read there. This is the other problem because you're going to throw up basically. And many people do. Okay? So, when they were doing astronaut training for the first lot, they had to find people with incredibly strong hearts and also incredibly strong stomachs. Because the thing is, if you're in a capsule with two other people, you don't want one of them to die and vomit at the same time. Because you don't want to be in like a vomit filled capsule with a corpse for a couple of weeks. It ain't going to be good. Okay? Now, the Soviet Union basically found an incredibly hardcore man. His name is Yuri Gagarin. It's 12th of April, 1961. He was shot into space. Yuri had a number of things going for him. Firstly, he was an incredibly intelligent guy. Really clever. Other thing is, incredibly strong heart. He actually, on his launch, okay, they weren't quite that technical with how to get him up there. He felt 12 times the pull of gravity for about 30 seconds. Okay, he had an incredibly strong stomach as well, as you can imagine. The other thing going for him was, he was actually basically flying a converted nuclear missile. So they'd taken a nuclear warhead off the top of it and they decided to cram a human being inside it. Actually, they forgot what the payload was going to be though, a human being. And he was actually the shortest person they could find that had the qualifications to fit in. And he basically went into space in the fetal position. They basically just squeezed him in and he was going like that trying to flick the switches and he was up there for a good few hours flying around but they basically got him up there so now the Americans got very 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 upset but just before they did this they, they basically decided to try and cheat right the problems the Americans had was their rockets kept blowing up okay and not what they wanted the Soviet rockets kept blowing up as well but because the news didn't get out the Americans thought my god these Soviets are really really good so basically their rockets kept blowing up didn't want to put a human being on it so what they did was they took a helium weather balloon. You can see him, there's a bit down here, it's full of all kind of cameras and sensors and science equipment. They basically gutted that and stuck a human being in it and let it go. And decided, and this guy very nearly got into space. His name is Joe Kittinger and this is the video footage from him. So basically this is a camera on top of him. This is a jet trying to fly him. He was basically, he did this three times, okay? So there he is in his little cradle, just wandering around, didn't have a seatbelt, anything. He's in this pressurized spacesuit, okay? So what do you do when you're that high up? Okay, this one was in his third and final launch. He's at 33 kilometers up here, okay? So what do you do? You jump. He did that three times, okay? The first time he went up to 23 kilometers. On the way down, his suit developed a fault. He went into a flat spin. He started spinning, spinning, spinning. Got faster and faster, he passed out. The flight recorder on his suit recorded that he felt 23 times the pull of gravity on his way down there. He's, he's not only is he the highest parachute jump, but he survived it. You can see he's so high, if you can see it in a minute, you can just see, can see the atmosphere there, he's way above it, okay? So that's the second time he went up the same height, 23 kilometers, all went fine. The third time, this is the launch here, he went up, he went up to 33 kilometers up again. On his way up, his spacesuit developed a hole, just about here on his hand, okay, so it's about there. So he got to about 15 kilometers up and he started to feel unwell, sort of gas coming out. He said, what do I do? So any normal sane human being would have bought the mission and just jumped out. No, not Joe. He just put his hand over the hole, <laughs> and held it until he got up to the height and then he just dropped out. Okay? His arm and his hand swelled up to twice its normal size. Basically, it sealed up the hole in the end. Basically, he was that high up. He's about above about 99% of the atmosphere there. <laughs> he was an absolute kind of nutcase. On his way down here, okay, he nearly breaks the speed of sound. He's travelling <laughs> at 280 metres a second. Speed of sound is 340 metres a second. He's the fastest unaided human being. Okay, he, No one knew about this until recently. Landed, they said, very well, Joe, and they just packed him off to Vietnam. After about a month there, he got captured by the Vietnamese and spent two years being tortured in a Vietnamese prison camp. Come back, and he didn't say a word. He's an absolute nutcase, okay? Red Bull are trying to uh, do this again now, you might see it. And they keep using his footage, trying to pass it off as theirs, the cheeky little buggers. Anyway, right, Joe Kittinger, amazing hardcore guy, okay? So, um, 
Get so this they're not in space really. So it's two nil. Americans are getting upset, right? What can we do? What can we do? We've got to do something. We've got to do something that's going to kind of knock those damn Ruskies off their perch. So what they decide is they're going to go to hopefully it'll come up in a minute the moon. So they think right, we've got to go to the moon. Go go to the moon. Going to the moon though has got some really big big problems. So oh, another volunteer please. Good. This one involve any explosions so you're good so come on up round of applause please <laughs> just wait what's your name mate alfie alfie i'm simon nice to meet you right and just wait there for two seconds right so there's a lot of problems going into space and going to the moon first is that space is a vacuum and things behave very very strangely in a vacuum now okay Alfie's going to help me out with an experiment here. Now this is one of those dodgy kind of coffee storage you can get, okay? Now, just to prove it, can someone please open up? You'll do so. Can you open these up to prove that I'm tampered with them? So it's like a really poor magic trick, okay? So these are Tunnock's tea cakes. Have you ever had them? They're marshmallow coated with chocolate with a nice biscuity base. Luckily, these are exactly the same consistency as your eyeball. Okay, so your eyeball is basically like a ton of tea cake. Okay, it's got the same liquid inside it. Well, it's not marshmallow in your eyeball, I can assure you of that, but it feels the same. It behaves. Can you unwrap that, please, for me and place it inside here? So, right. Are you feeling strong, Alfie? Good, right. So, Alfie is going to remove all the air from that. So what you need to do is place it on top and just start, hold it down and pump like that. So basically what Alfie's doing is he's pumping, <laughs> go for it, really hard. So Alfie's removing the air from inside here. Hopefully it'll go in a minute. So this is what would happen to your body. Can you see anything happening? Keep going. So it should start, there's air inside the marshmallow. Keep going, let's give it a go. creating a vacuum in there. Hopefully you can see. Oh, I've got to give myself a heart attack. Right, so basically, the air inside wants to get out. Huh? So basically it starts expanding out. So this would be, this would what would happen to your eyeballs in space, basically. They'd pop. Not really what you want. When you seal it back down, you can see it shrinking back down to its normal size. Thank you very much, Alfie. And you get the, this is why you came up really, wasn't it? There you go. Right. So your eyeballs will pop. Not a good look. The other problem is you can do that with a balloon as well. Balloons are very similar to your lung. So basically in space, were this to happen, you can see here that your lungs would expand, it pop. No one's actually tried this, which I don't believe, because I would really well see if this happened, but allegedly your lungs will pop out of your mouth. Now I don't know if that's true or not. They must have tried this with monkeys or rats or something, but allegedly you know. So basically your lungs would expand, very bad for you. Uh, marshmallows would go up just like your eyeball. The other amazing thing is what happens to water in a vacuum. So I can't do this experiment here because it's quite dangerous. I had to do this at work. So you'll have to believe me that this is water at room temperature, okay? You can turn it here, turn it on. It sounds like a bong. And I'm removing all the air from inside here. I guess it's a familiar sound from around these parts, isn't it? Okay. So maybe people are doing this experiment. Who knows? And so this water now, water that boils at 100 degrees because air is pushing down on it, okay? And it, the water molecules need energy to be liberated to become a gas. Now, if you start removing that air pushing down on it, the water doesn't need to be as hot. It doesn't need that much energy to become a gas anymore. And so what happens is water will boil at room temperature. Wow. That's at 20 degrees. It hasn't changed in temperature at all. All that's happened is, is the air on top of it pushing down is no longer there, so the water doesn't need as much energy to become liberated, to become a gas. And then hopefully I'll turn it off in a sec there and you can see it just becomes a liquid again. In space, your blood would boil. Literally, it boils straight out of your skin. Okay, that's what would happen to you. So going into space is quite a problem. Okay, the other problem with going into space is that it's very, very cold. About, with, if you're not in direct sunlight, space gets down to about minus 270 degrees. Okay? That's near a point called absolute zero, where everything becomes a solid. Okay? Oh, I should point out, I didn't say about the vacuum. So, there was a guy called Alexei Leonov. He was the first man ever to do a spacewalk. Okay? 
It was about the 70th anniversary of it soon or something like that. I should have learned. But uh, anyway, so when he went in there, he was meant to be outside for two minutes. Okay, so he went outside the space capsule. The Soviets are actually filming it on a live broadcast. He's meant to be out for two minutes. Unfortunately, they forgot that his spacesuit would inflate. So while he was outside, he went outside, spacesuit inflated, so he decides to get back in. He's now too big to fit back into the doorway of the space capsule. So they're filming it, going down live, and then obviously after about five minutes, they're going, oh, something's quite wrong here. So they literally just pan the camera to one side and just saying, you've probably seen enough of that now. So they just point out black space as Alexi's desperately trying to get back into, what they think was a really cunning thing, they just rewound the tape. So it looked like he got back in really easily. <laughs> <laughs> and no one noticed, even the Americans didn't notice until recently. The guy, so he's out there, he can't get in, his mate's inside going, oh God, they're actually giving him cyanide, so in case it went wrong, you can kill yourself. Brilliant. So basically what he did, so he's sitting there, for 13 minutes he's outside, okay? Obviously he starts sweating. His spacesuit filled up with sweat basically up to his knees. I don't know if it was just sweat, but basically, it was just, uh, he filled up to his knees with sweat. The, in the end, the only way he could get back in was to depressurize his own spacesuit. So he actually had to let the gas out of the spacesuit to get back in. He gave himself the bends doing that. So basically, his, his blood started to boil. He was seriously, he's still alive. But he basically really messed himself up to get back inside. So, you know, these things did, really did go wrong. Now, as I was saying, space is very, very cold. Out of direct sunlight, space can get down to about minus 270 degrees. That's basically everything's a solid at that temperature. And this can do very strange things. So there's something called liquid nitrogen. I can get hold of it very easy at work, luckily. And basically, it's about minus 200 degrees. Now, I've placed inside that banana. Bananas are great because they're roughly the same constituency as your, your fingers, your flesh, basically. So I've put a banana into a liquid nitrogen, and it's cooling down to about minus 200 degrees, the same temperature as space. Now, I've sped this up. It's kind of like a scientific Benny Hill. But basically, it's just been sped up there. So I've got a banana in it. I keep testing it. So it's being cooled down. So if you don't have some sort of refrigeration or warming unit, you're going to bake in space or freeze. So on the back of a spacesuit, when you see the, uh, the people on the moon, and they did go to the moon, uh, basically that's actually nearly all a refrigeration and heating unit. It's a giant refrigerator on his back, basically. Because the problem is, if you're exposed to space, you can sit here on this, me clearing my throat, basically, this is what's gonna happen. So basically, get the banana out. Here it comes, hurry up. So. This is about minus 200 degrees, okay? This would be what would happen to your body. So you, your flesh is all nice and bendy now and it's all very good. Okay, this banana, your finger, minus 200 degrees. This is why I can't bring it with me, by the way. Actually, it's... you just become brittle, basically. That's what's happened to Walt Disney's head, by the way. So they've cut, he's cut his head off and he's frozen in liquid nitrogen. Not only have they got to solve the problem of death, they've got to solve the problem of his head not being attached to his body, which is quite remarkable. But anyway, so eventually the Americans did get to the moon. Brilliant. So basically the Russians got bored of the space race now and didn't really bother. They nearly got there. They were about two years away from landing on the moon. They kind of gave up. This is basically... Uh, that's actually... No, that's Alan Shepard, who should have been the first human in space, but his rocket blew up just before he was about to get on it. So basically, this is Alan Shepard, the guy that played uh, golf on the moon. That's his little buggy there. It's a bit like kind of action man, G.I. Joe. Brilliant. Now, many of you hopefully have heard of Buzz Aldrin. So basically, there's this... I don't want to swear, but idiot in America called Bart Sabrell, and he's one of many people who believes that we did not, or human beings did not go to the moon. So... Buzz Aldrin's in his 80s, basically now, and this guy decides to start going and berating him, okay? This is what he's saying. Don't say that to Buzz Aldrin. He knocks the guy out, okay? In his 80s, he still knock people out. I love the guy, okay? He's brilliant. Just, he's an old test flight like, pilot. You don't go up to him and call him a coward. Why are you out of your mind? Anyway, so brilliant. So we got there. Now, just to finish off, so that's kind of up to the present day. We've got to talk of the future. So this is a TIE fighter. But does anyone know what TIE stands for? It does actually stand for something. Twin oil engine. Yeah, there he is. Someone who's been as lonely as me, haven't you? Crying into his keyboard, Googling at two in the morning, useless information. Yes.
stands for Twin Ion Engine. And basically, we are making these things now, okay? So, I've got here, this is something called an ion lifter. And I've got one here, it's basically tin foil. It looks like a mad hat, but it's actually tin foil attached to some sticks. This is running purely on electricity, about 30,000 volts. Okay, so there's a little wire at the top. <laughs> basically, you're supplying electrical current to it, and it's basically lifting it off. Okay, there's no jiggery pokery there. You can see the wire there. So when people see them, they say they see UFOs and things like that. They're actually probably seeing these type of prototype aircraft. You can make these very easily. And this is basically the future of space flight. This is what governments are kind of making now. It's very, very easy as long as you can get 30,000 volts to lift these things. So basically, this is what it looks like. You've got positive wire at the top, negative skirt at the bottom. The negative, these are electrons, okay, electricity basically, they ionise, charge the air, the air becomes positively charged, it gets dragged down, your thing lifts up, so you get a kind of blowing down, and it lifts your craft off above the ground, and this is basically what people are trying to do, now with rockets, instead of taking expensive fuel, because it costs actually $20,000 a kilo to take something into space, Okay? So that means if you want to take a litre of water into space, that's going to cost you $20,000. Most of it is fuel. Okay? These things work on a fraction of the fuel to power them. You basically get electrons in there, positive ions, they're attracted to this negative grid, shoot out the back, it's called an ion beam, and that propels you forward. And this is the future of spacecraft, ladies and gentlemen. So I think, hopefully, we'll use these to go to the moon. And then on to Mars, basically, we've got to build, moon. well, before the, the idea was 2015, we'll go, go back to the moon. Basically, unfortunately, there was a problem with the economy, as many of you may have heard, and kind of we're not going there anymore, but we will one day. So, I think kind of I've run out of time. I might have some questions. Oh, you, I've got time for questions. But thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. You've basically learned everything I know about rockets and Nazis. So, brilliant. I uh, hope you enjoyed it. Thank you very much. that make the world a better place like seriously he went into was it 33 kilometers above the earth and jumped and did it three times and then he spent two years in a concentration camp yeah, being, in Vietnam horribly tortured. being horribly tortured horribly. and lived to tell the tale yep. and, uh, yeah, he's just doing his badass professional Very science badass Very what, amazing <laughs> So, we are Guerrilla Science, and we are here to prove conclusively that science is not boring. And I think people like Simon Foster and Joe Kinninger do so very capably. Don't you agree? I, I wouldn't put myself in the same kind of thing as Joe. Yeah. <laughs> no, maybe. He's a little bit hardcore. He's a little bit hardcore. There's also, uh, the last time you did this, you showed some videos of some Russian guy as well who did that. And then the one who spun. Or was that Joe? That was Joe. That was Joe. Amazing. That was, I think that was the same video. Yeah. Maybe. Maybe. Uh, anyway, so we are uh, Guerrilla Science. We are about to have a short interlude of about 10 minutes, and then we'll be going on a hunt for subatomic particles. So do please join us. We're going to go and see if we can discover the Higgs boson out in the fields of Shambhala. Uh, again, this is Simon Foster. Don't you wish that your teacher was like him? Isn't he amazing? just say thank you very much. Sorry, there's my head. I forgot, actually. So there's my, if you want to, I'm on Twitter. I don't really use it that much. But basically, yes, yeah, there you are. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> I should say contractually, I'm I'm employed by Imperial College. I should have said that at the start, actually. So yes, that's where I'm.